Hello and welcome to this video on free and bound variables in the Lambda Calculus. So what is the Lambda Calculus? We looked at it before, if you haven't seen that video, check it out. We also looked at how we define the grammar of the Lambda Calculus in a previous video, which should explain what this horrible mess is. Um, you can go check that out as well, links will be in the description. What is Lambda Calculus? It's a way of mathematically describing our programs so we can figure out stuff about them. And so I alluded to that earlier, but we're really going to use that today uh, in understanding free variables. So what are free and bound variables? Well, we're going to define that with two rules. Our first rule is function abstraction binds to variables, and our second rule is variables that are not bound are considered to be free or unbound is the other, other word we might use for them. So let's have a look at that in practice. It seems like these rules are so simple, but almost too simple to the point where it doesn't make sense how they immediately apply. So I think some examples would really help us out here. So let's look at that first rule, function abstraction binds variables. So here we have an expression that I think we've seen before, where we've got a function abstraction on the left, where we've got that backslash x arrow x. Uh, here, that x in the function body, we're going to say is bound by the function abstraction, because the function abstraction is using x as a parameter. So when we're looking at that x in the, in the function body, you might intuitively think of it as, oh, well, that's coming from the function, or that, that's somehow created by the function, that x is created by the function, and we're going to use that in the function. And that's basically what we mean by free and bound variables. We might have a slightly more complicated expression. So for example, if we have a nested abstraction, where here we're saying, well, x goes to another function, which is y goes to x. This interior x, this x in the middle, is still bound by that top level x, right? It's not bound by the y, because there's a different, different symbols. Uh, but that x has been bound by uh, the, the function abstraction above it, or really the function abstraction, it's in the parent of that. If this was a y, the y would be bound by, by the function abstraction there. Uh, but if this was, so for example, you know, not bound by anything, that's where our second rule kicks in, and we say variables not bound are free. Um, so we might say that y, well, the y isn't bound by the z function abstraction, it isn't bound by the x function abstraction, so it's just free. It's not being bound by anything in this expression. Similarly, if we had a z, that's also going to be free. Even though we have bound z in a function abstraction in the middle, that's not above or it's not a parent of z, so z can't really be considered to be bound there. And this is actually when you when you write code in a lot of programming languages uh, and you try and reference a variable that you haven't kind of defined yet or you haven't bound in a function, it will say, hey, that's unbound or don't know what that means or give you a reference error. And that's kind of what we're getting at here, what, where they're free, uh, they're not defined anyway, they're not bound by anything. It's not necessarily an error and this is a valid lambda expression, uh, but it might not mean anything or it may, may have you know more caveats to it. So Earlier, I promised we were going to use this crazy looking um, definition of lambda calculus so that we've broken it down into these building blocks. We can actually use that to write mathematical formulae on top of our building blocks. So what are the mathematical formulae for free variables? You might, you know, have a go now and, and try and write them out um, and, and how we might calculate them for each expression. And so you actually think, well, if we calculate them or if we have a rule for each expression, then no matter whatever overall expression we have, as long as it's built out of these building blocks, we can always apply the rule and find out what the free variables are. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And so uh, you can pause now if you want to try and derive them yourself, but they basically look like this. It's pretty simple. So if we have a variable, well, it's not being bound by anything yet. So we're just going to say it is free. Um, and this is kind of using set notation. So we're saying the free variables in X, that's the capital F V in just a variable X, is just the set of that variable x because it's not being bound by anything. If we've got a function application, well, nothing really happens to the free variables there. So we've just got two different expressions. So we're going to union those two expressions together, which are going to smoosh them or everything all together, and that those are going to be our free variables because what we're not changing them, right? It's just basically adding the sets together. And then finally, if there's a function abstraction, that's where our kind of first rule comes in, where we're binding variables. We're going to say, well, we've bound x, the parameter x here. And remember that x could really be a y or a z or a different different thing, but with like saying x is a almost a placeholder. Whatever that x is, we're going to remove from the set of free variables in the function body e. So this is where you know we have some body, and then anything in the body, we're going to remove it from the set of free variables if that's what's being bound by this function abstraction. 
So these rules maybe will make sense, maybe won't. Hopefully an example will be put into practice. These rules might shed some light on it or just be good practice. So let's uh, we'll shorten the name of these rules to var, app, and abs like we did uh, earlier for some of our breaking down of expressions just to get them on the screen. We've got this example here where we want to find the three variables in this expression where we've got a function abstraction on the left and a variable y on the right. And our function abstraction is backslash z to z and our variable is just y. So let's break this down. Uh, well, at the first level, we've got a function application. So we apply the function application rule where we take the expression on the left and we find the three variables in it. We take the expression on the right and find the three variables in it and then union them. Uh, and so that's our application rule there. And so let's look in the left-hand side where we've got the three variables in the function abstraction. And again, we apply the abstraction rule here uh, where you know here, as I said before, the x doesn't actually have to be x, it can be a z. Um, so we're going to say three variables in our function body, which is just z, minus that uh, z because we bound it as a parameter. If we look at the right at the top expression again, we've got the three variables in y. Well, that looks very much like our first rule for variables. And so we've just got y in our set. And similarly for our three variables in z, we've just got z. So now we have a load of these expressions. Uh, you might be wondering, okay, what do we do now? Uh, well, now we basically just need to solve these equations. And yes, we probably could have been solving them as we go or just expanded them more than one line, but this is just some very basic set math. So let's say, for example, take these two here. Well, we know what the three variables in Z are. It's just Z, so we've got that. We can say, oh, well, the set of Z minus the set of Z is that's just the empty set by, by set math. Well, now we can substitute this in we can substitute the free variables and y in, uh, we can calculate the union, and so our free variables and expression are just y, which is what we'd expect, right? Because the z is bound, obviously, by the function abstraction it's directly in, and that y doesn't seem to be bound by anything, so the free variables in that expression are y, as we would expect. You might say, well, this is a hugely inefficient way, I can just look at it and see, and that is probably true, but if you're a computer, you might not be able to do that. And also, if you've got a very large, complicated expression, you'd like some rules so you can just keep following them mindlessly, especially if you're a computer or working it out in a compiler to determine what the three variables somewhere might be. And similarly, uh, you might say, well, what's the point of three variables? They can be useful for figuring out what is and isn't bound, but also it's an example of something which can tell us that, hey, when we have these building blocks, we can build rules above them. And that's where we're basically going to get with type systems. We are actually going to use the definition of free variables because that's necessary to, to calculate some types, but that's the main reason we're looking at this now. So just so we understand what free variables are, we're not going to use the actual um, long process. You're welcome to do that if you'd like. Um, we're just kind of going to do it by inspection. So let's take a look. Um, now we can identify the three variables in here are that x, y, and z. The first x well, actually it's bound by the function abstraction uh, kind of two layers above it. The y, there is a y being bound by the function abstraction, but that y is not inside that function abstraction, so that's actually free. And same as that z, that z isn't bound anywhere um, at all, and definitely no function abstractions above it, so that is free as well. Another example, um, so a slightly more complicated one. So we've got four variables here. We can take a look at the x at the beginning. Well, that's obviously bound because there's a function abstraction directly above it. The y directly after it is not bound because there's no function abstraction directly above it that has bound y. The next y is bound because there is a function abstraction above it that has, has bound y. And the final y is completely out of everything and that definitely has no function abstractions on top of it. So that is free as well in our expression. Hopefully that gives you a good idea of what free and bound variables are in number expressions and also how we can apply rules that are based around the syntax or the building blocks of our lambda calculus to determine other properties of our expressions. Thanks and see you in the next video.